This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week, we honor the year in music for 1999, along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 1999. We also look at the case for putting Joe Cocker into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, plus our Spotlight Hall of Fame is the Aria Hall of Fame in Melbourne, Australia. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 1999. In music, the Recording Industry Association of America went to court against Napster, which was officially founded in 1999. The RIAA also went to court against consumers who illegally downloaded music. The first person convicted was a student of the University of Oregon who received two years of probation along with only being allowed limited internet time, which, when you consider that it was 1999 internet, meant that he really didn't miss anything. I mean, it's not like you could play video games with your friends or stream anything at that time. Plus, social media was, well, AOL chat rooms, I guess. Anywho, David Bowie's Hours became the first full album to be legally available for downloading. He released it digitally two weeks before he released it either on vinyl or on CD. A&M Records merged with Universal Music Group, becoming yet another historic record label to be completely taken over by one of the big three. The Columbine High School shooting happened in 1999, and as is the case anytime something like that happened, music and video games were blamed. Specifically, the bands this time around, Marilyn Manson, Ramstein, and KMFDM. 1999 was also the year of the boy bands with In Sync, the Backstreet Boys, the Disney Channel sound with Britney Spears, and the rap metal sound with Limp Bizkit. The Woodstock 99 festival took place, which was marred by alleged sexual assaults and riots. Also in festival news, it was the first year of Instagram in the desert, otherwise known these days as Coachella. Korn became the first rock group to perform a concert at the famed Apollo Theater in Harlem, New York. A man attacked George Harrison in his own home with a knife. Puff Daddy and rapper Shine were arrested on weapons charges in connection with a shooting at a New York City nightclub. Puff Daddy would be found not guilty. As the year wore down... Artists got ready for the New Year Millennium celebrations as everyone's favorite conspiracy theory about Y2K haunted the events of New Year's Eve. For those of you who forgot that year's version of QAnon, the Y2K bug was going to make everyone's electrical devices shut off at midnight as computers and such couldn't read the year 2000 in their system. The electric grid was supposed to shut down, mass hysteria, eventually zombies, I'm sure, and The Walking Dead. Of course, none of that actually happened. Well, okay, except for the zombie part, that those were mainly the people coming back from partying hard that night. Groups that formed in 1999 included 3LW, The All-American Rejects, Breaking Benjamin, Avenged Sevenfold, Cosmic Gate, Dashboard Confessional, Alice DJ, Discord, G-Unit, Goldfrap, Fiction Plane, Junior Boys, Montgomery Gentry, Nerd, The National, Ozone, Madison Avenue, A Perfect Circle, Rascal Flats, Taking Back Sunday, Tattoo, Simple Plan, and Zombie Nation. Bands that either broke up until their inevitable reunions, of course, or announced their hiatus include KMFDM, The Lost Boys, Love and Rockets, Katrina and the Waves, Lord Tariq and Peter Guns, Maroon 5, Bad Company, Blind Melon, The Boo Radleys, The Band, Mad Season, Morphine, The New Radicals, Pavement, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Grantly Buffalo, Squeeze, The Jesus and Mary Chain, The Jesus Lizard, and The Verve. The Animals officially reformed in 1999. 
The biggest albums of the year were by the Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears, Creed, Dido, the Dixie Chicks, now of course known as the Chicks, Destiny's Child, Celine Dion, Blink-182, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Shania Twain, InSync, Ricky Martin, Christina Aguilera, Santana, TLC, Kid Rock, and Eminem. Singles-wise, at the age of 52, Cher became the oldest female artist to reach number one on the Billboard 100 singles chart with her song, Believe. Hit Me Baby One More Time, the debut single from Britney Spears, was one of the biggest singles of the year. Other big hits included Lou Bega's Mambo No. 5, Eiffel 65's Blue, TLC's No Scrubs, The Backstreet Boys with I Want It That Way, Cher's aforementioned big hit Believe, Monica's Angel of Mine, Whitney Houston's Heartbreak Hotel, Sixpence None the Richer's Kiss Me, Sugar Ray's Every Morning, Deborah Cox's Nobody's Supposed to Be Here, and Ricky Martin's classic Livin' La Vida Loca. The most overplayed song that year by far was actually a song that came out in the early 1980s, Prince's 1999, for obvious reasons. Faith Hill had one of the biggest selling country albums, along with the Dixie Chicks, Shania Twain, Tim McGraw, Garth Brooks, and Leanne Rimes. Those six artists were the only ones, in fact, to hit number one on the Billboard Country Albums chart during the year, with most of those artists holding down the number one slot for more than four weeks at a time. In fact, Shania Twain's album, Come On Over, spent 26 weeks, that is literally half a year, at number one on that particular chart. Faith Hill had the biggest country single of the year with Breathe. Other country hits were Lone Star's Amazed, Kenny G's Old Lang Syne, for obvious reasons, Kenny Chesney's How Forever Feels, Martina McBride's I Love You, Tim McGraw's Please Remember Me, and also his hit Something Like That, Joe D. Messina's Stand By Me, George Strait's Write This Down, and Mark Chestnut's I Don't Want to Miss a Thing. In hip-hop, there were transcending albums like Most Def's Black on Both Sides, The Roots' Things Fall Apart, MF Doom's Operation Doomsday, Eminem's The Slim Shady LP, DMX's And Then There Was X, Jay-Z's Volume 3, Life and Times of S. Carter, Silk the Shocker's Made Man, Method Man and Red Man's Blackout, Nas's I Am, and Juvenile's The G-Code. As far as singles went, Busta Rhymes and Janet Jackson had What's It Gonna Be, Naughty by Nature had Jamboree, Mo Thug's Family had Ghetto Cowboy, Jay-Z had The Hard Knock Life, and also the song Can I Get a from the Rush Hour soundtrack. Juvenile had Back That Thang Up, Lauren Hill had Everything Is Everything, Old Dirty Bastard and Khalees had Got Your Money, Warren G had I Want It All, and Q-Tip had Vibrant Thing. In dance music, there were future EDM festival anthems that became huge hits in 1999, like At 9 P.M. Till I Come from ATB, Expander by Sasha, Carte Blanche by Veracocha, Eiffel 45's Blue, Boom 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 by The Benga Boys, Fat Boy Slim's Right Here, Right Now, DJ Tiesto's remix of William Orbit and Ferry Corsten's rendition of Barber's Adagio for Strings, and also Better Off Alone by Alice DJ, which still gets played in festivals all over the place these days. In fact, it was one of the top five most played tracks during 2023's festivals, like Tomorrowland while Blue actually got the David Guetta remix treatment and was turned into the chart-topping song Feeling All Right. Speaking of music festivals, 1999 was the year of the first Ultra Miami Music Festival, which was started by Russell Fabish and Alex Ohms. The movie that chronicled the British club scene, Human Traffic, opened. Other popular EDM tracks were DJ Tiesto's remix of Delirium and Sarah McLaughlin's Silence, Amber's Sexual, Basement Jax's Red Alert, Groove Armada's I See You Baby, Shaking That Thang, Madison Avenue's Don't Call Me Baby, The Chemical Brothers' Hey Boy, Hey Girl, 
and Zombie Nation's Kerncraft 400, which is a song that you know even if you don't think that you know it because it's played at virtually every soccer match. In fact, it's one of the biggest sports anthems of all time. Moby's album Play was also very popular that year. The top 10 DJs on DJ Mag's Top 100 DJs list included Paul Oakenfold, Carl Cox, Sasha, Judge Jules, Paul Van Dyke, John Digweed, Fatboy Slim, Danny Teneglia, Roger Sanchez, and Nick Warren. The top artists in Latin music were Ricky Martin, Elvis Crespo, Selena, Enrique Iglesias, Shakira, Buena Vista Social Club, Mana, Conjunto Primavera, Alejandro Fernandez, and Jennifer Lopez and Mark Anthony. In theater, musicals or revivals that opened on Broadway included Amadeus, Fosse, Annie Get Your Gun, Kiss Me Kate, Peter Pan, Saturday Night Fever, and Swing. Musical films that came out in 1999 were Double Platinum and The Adventures of Elmo and Grouchland, along with animated movies Tarzan, South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, and Madeline Lost in Paris. Artists who were born in 1999 included Lil Nas X, Madison Beer, Sabrina Carpenter, NBA Youngboy, Harvey, Pop Smoke, Polo G, Trippy Red, YNW Melly, Jack Avery of Why Don't We, and Daniel Seavey. Artists who unfortunately passed away in 1999 included conductor Robert Shaw, singer Buddy Knox, rapper Big L, singer Dusty Springfield, jazz singer Helen Forrest, musician Jackson C. Frank, composer Ernest Gold, singer Joe Williams, singer and actor Anthony Newley, singer Roger Troutman, band leader Al Hurt, conductor Paul Sasher, singer Mel Torme, reggae singer Dennis Brown, singer Guy Mitchell, musician Mark Sandman, drummer Gar Samuelson, musician Moondog, Singer Frankie Vaughn, jazz trumpet player Art Farmer, musician Milt Jackson, singer and actor Hoyt Axton, composer Frank Duvall, Adrian Borland of The Sound, drum and bass icon Chemistry, musician Doug Sam, saxophonist Grover Washington Jr., jazz musician Charlie Bird, musician Scatman John, musician Rick Danko, singer and actor Rex Allen, musician Hank Snow, and singer Curtis Mayfield. In awards for the music of 1999, Carlos Santana was the big winner at the Grammy Awards, tying Michael Jackson for the most Grammy Award wins in one year with eight awards, including Album of the Year for Supernatural and Record and Song of the Year for Smooth with Rob Thomas of Matchbox 20. Christina Aguilera won Best New Artist that year. Britney Spears' Hit Me Baby One More Time won Video of the Year at the MTV Video Music Awards. Will Smith, Shania Twain, and the Backstreet Boys won at the American Music Awards. The Backstreet Boys also won Artists of the Year at the Billboard Music Awards, while R. Kelly won Album of the Year for the album R at the Soul Train Music Awards. And Shania Twain, Ricky Martin, and the Backstreet Boys won at the People's Choice Awards. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held in Jerusalem that year, Charlotte Nilsson from Sweden won for the song Take Me to Your Heaven. Shania Twain won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, and she also won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards. The band Travis won Best British Album for The Man Who, and Robbie Williams won Best Song for She's the One at the Brit Awards. Alanis Morissette won Best Album for Supposed Former Infatuation Junkie, while The Tragically Hip won Best Song for Bob Cajun at the Juno Awards. Powder Finger won Best Album of the Year for The Internationalist, and they also won Best Song of the Year for The Day You Come at the Aria Music Awards. At the Tony Awards, Fosse won Best Musical, and Annie Get Your Gun won Best Revival of a Musical. The Pulitzer Prize for Music was won by John Adams for On the Transmigration of Souls. 
at the Academy Awards. Musically, Phil Collins won Best Song for You'll Be In My Heart from the movie Tarzan, while John Corigliano won Best Original Score for The Red Violin. Talvin Singh won the Mercury Music Prize for the album OK. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony was held on March 15, 1999 at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. At the ceremony, Paul McCartney made one of his first public appearances since the death of his wife and Wings bandmate Linda McCartney in 1998 from cancer. Paul was there to present legendary producer Sir George Martin for induction into the non-performers category. Charles Brown, along with Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys, were inducted into the Early Influencers category. And in the Performers category, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inducted a popular lineup that consisted of Bruce Springsteen, the Staples Singers, Del Shannon, Sir Paul McCartney, Curtis Mayfield, Billy Joel, and this next artist. Mary Elizabeth Catherine Bernadette O'Brien was born on April 16, 1939 in Essex, Middlesex, England. You know her better these days as Dusty Springfield. Her career started in the late 1950s as a member of the Lana Sisters and also the Springfields, with the Springfields having the hits Island of Dreams, Say I Won't Be There, and Silver Threads and Golden Needles. She went solo in 1963 and had hits right off the bat with I Only Want to Be With You, Stay A While, All I See Is You, I'll Try Anything, Wishing and Hoping, and You Don't Have to Say You Love Me. Dusty developed a fashion style that included ultra-blonde bouffant hair, heavy makeup, and flowing evening gowns. She also developed a love of American R&B and soul music. Dusty showcased a lot of it when she hosted the TV series Dusty. In fact, between 1966 to 1969, she hosted five television shows in England. In 1968, Dusty was at a crossroads in her career. For starters, the musical tastes of the general public had begun to change. Also, her relationships with the people whom she had relied on to write songs for her began to change, and the hits were becoming harder to come by. Dusty decided to go all in with her love of American soul music. She signed a record deal with Atlantic Records, mainly due to the fact that her idol, Aretha Franklin, was also on the record label. Next, she decided to work with the people who were responsible for a lot of those hit soul records, so Dusty went to Memphis to record her next album. There was just one slight problem when she got there. She felt so awestruck with working with her idols that she couldn't sing the way she really wanted to. She felt completely inferior, so much so that she ended up re-recording her vocals at a studio in New York City. The album, Dusty in Memphis, was released on March 31, 1969, but sold poorly, very poorly. It did, however, manage to have one hit on it, the now classic song, Son of a Preacher Man. Critically, though, the album was greeted with applause and was nominated for a Grammy Award, and it has since taken on almost mythic proportions and has landed on many of those all-time greatest albums lists. As far as Dusty went, her career in the 1970s was, to be nice about it, interesting. She sang backup on songs for her friends like Elton John. That's actually Dusty's vocals on the song The Bitches Back for Elton. She also put out a few more albums that didn't do all that well. Her personal life also became fodder for the British tabloids, as she was a member of the LGBTQ community, so she ended up fleeing to America. Dusty's career received a bounce in 1987 when Neil Tennant of the Pet Shop Boys came calling. Neil wanted her to sing on the Pet Shop Boys' new single, What Have I Done to Deserve This? Dusty accepted, and the song became a huge hit, landing at number two in both America and also in the UK. At last, the public refound Dusty. And at this point, Dusty and Memphis found a new audience, and the stature of the album began to rise again. However, 
two weeks before Dusty was to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1999, Dusty passed away at the age of 59 from breast cancer, ending a great career that should have and could have been so much more. Dusty Springfield had 21 studio albums. Of those, two hit the top 10 in the UK, while the highest any of them got in America was 1964's Stay a While, I Only Want to Be With You, which actually hit number 62. Dusty also put out 69 singles. Of those, 12 hit the top 10 in the UK, while four hit the top 10 in America. Dusty has been placed on numerous greatest female singers of all time lists, including Q Magazine, Mojo Magazine, VH1, and Rolling Stone Magazine. Rolling Stone also named Dusty in Memphis as one of the greatest albums of all time, while the album was also inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame and also the United States Library of Congress National Recording Registry. Presented for induction by 1994 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee Sir Elton John, Dusty Springfield, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, class of 1999. And if you would like to check out Dusty's music, I have put her onto this week's podcast playlist, which is on YouTube Music, the link of which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History In-Depth podcast where we go more in-depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History In-Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. This week, we're going to look at the case for putting Joe Cocker into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Let's check out the stats. So, as we always do, to the tale of the tape we go. Joe Cocker released 22 studio albums, 9 live albums, and 14 compilation albums. Of those, 5 hit the top 40 in America, with 1970's live album Mad Dog and Englishmen hitting number 2, but no other top 10s. In Joe's native United Kingdom, 9 hit the top 40, with 3 hitting the top 10. Joe also released 68 singles. Of those, nine hit the top 40 in America, with three of those hitting the top 10. 1975's hit You Are So Beautiful hit number five. 1970's The Letter hit number seven. And 1982's duet with Jennifer Warnes, Up Where We Belong, from the hit movie An Officer and a Gentleman, starring Richard Gere, Deborah Winger, and in his Academy Award-winning performance, Louis Gossett Jr., Up Where We Belong won the Academy Award, by the way, for Best Song, and also won Joe Cocker a Grammy Award. In the UK, though, Joe had nine songs hit the top 40, with three of those nine hitting the top 10, including 1968's iconic cover version of the Beatles hit With a Little Help from My Friends, which hit number one. Joe's version was also the theme, by the way, to the original version of the TV show The Wonder Years, which starred Fred Savage as Kevin Arnold with the voice narration of Daniel Stern, who was Joe Pesci's burglar partner in the original Home Alone movies. little more trivia for you. Some of Joe's best-known songs that weren't big hits included You Can Leave Your Hat On from the 1986 movie Nine and a Half Weeks starring Kim Basinger and Mickey Rourke, along with the song Unchain My Heart and Feeling All Right, which has been used in a ton of commercials whether you knew it or not. Joe Cocker was known for his gravelly voice, blues rock style, and the way that he twisted his body when he sang, which was famously parodied by John Belushi in a sketch on Saturday Night Live. 
Joe influenced many artists with his performances and vocal energy, including Rod Stewart, Bruce Springsteen, Lenny Kravitz, Adele, Sam Smith, Amy Winehouse, John Fogarty, Hozier, Dave Grohl, Jack White, Marcus Mumford, Billy Corgan, Ryan Adams, Leon Bridges, John Legend, and Jason Isbell. Joe has also been called one of the 100 greatest singers of all time by Rolling Stone magazine. So after all of this, with so much commercial success and star power influence, why hasn't Joe Cocker been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame by now? Good question. Even Billy Joel tried to get Joe inducted in 2014 before Joe sadly passed away from lung cancer, but even that didn't work. Perhaps former board member Jan Wenner had something against Joe and kept him out. Winner, however, has since been ousted within the last year or so, so I think that the logjam against some of these artists will now begin to break. Any way you slice it, though, Joe Cocker finally deserves to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and to prove it, we have also put his music onto this week's podcast playlist, and like I said before, the link to that playlist is in the show notes. The Arts Center of Melbourne is a performing arts complex in the Melbourne Arts Precinct in Southbank, which is a suburb of Melbourne in Victoria, Australia. The center was constructed starting in 1973 and completed in 1984 when it fully opened. The center has a bunch of theaters and galleries and is noted for having not only the usual highbrow concerts and ballets from classical and jazz artists, but also having roller skating, a circus, and a movie theater. In the complex lies an exhibit for the ARIA Hall of Fame. ARIA, or Australian Recording Industry Association, is the Australian lobbying group for their music industry. They put on the ARIA Music Awards, which is their version of the Grammys. They also induct people into their Music Hall of Fame, simply called the ARIA Hall of Fame, because sometimes a simple name is a good name. The induction started in 1988 and have been going on ever since except for 2000 when no one was inducted and since 2020 when Archie Roach was the last one inducted into the hall. I will assume that that actually has something to do with COVID lockdown restrictions in Australia for the past few years, but hopefully they'll get back to putting people into the hall very soon. The number of annual inductees varies. For the last few years, only one act per year has been inducted. Go to artscentermelbourne.com.au for information as to when the organization does its yearly exhibit and what the times of operation are. We will, of course, put that link in the show notes. This week, however, we are going to talk about somebody who has been humongously overlooked and has not been put into the ARIA Hall of Fame, but should be. Rick Springfield was born Richard Springthorpe in Australia. His father was in the Australian Army. He started out in his teenage years playing in a bunch of different bands with names like Zoot, MPD Limited, and stuff like that. He signed a solo record deal with Spamic Records in 1971. His debut album, Beginnings, was released in 1972. A single off of that album, Speak to the Sky, hit number 14 on the Billboard Singles chart and the album went top 40. Some radio stations boycotted his songs, though, once word got around, true or false, that his American record label, Capitol Records, was paying people to buy the album. In the 1970s, he also put out three other albums, gaining an image as a teen idol along the way. He also started acting at this point. He was in episodes of The Six Million Dollar Man, The Hardy Boys' Nancy Drew Mysteries, Wonder Woman, The Rockford Files, and, fun fact, he was in the pilot episode of the original Battlestar Galactica TV show, where he played a pilot who doesn't make it past the pilot episode, unfortunately. Rest in peace, Lieutenant Zack. We barely knew you. 
As the 1980s dawned, Rick was offered the role of Dr. Noah Drake on the TV soap opera General Hospital. At the time, soap operas were huge. General Hospital's Luke and Laura wedding episode was and still is one of the most watched TV episodes of all time. Rick said yes to the offer because he didn't think that the album that he was working on at the time, Working Class Dog, was going to do too well, much like his last couple of albums that kind of did okay, but not spectacular. In the very beginning, it kind of looked like it was going to happen yet again. Then, one of the songs on that album got red hot. Jesse's Girl was written by Rick about his lust for his friend Gary's Girl, who, for the record, is not actually named Jesse. The song was released in February of 1981, but it didn't hit the Billboard chart until the last week of March. As the year went on, the song became more popular, which also drove ratings up for General Hospital, as more people realized that Dr. Noah Drake on General Hospital was also the guy on the radio, more people bought both the song and the album. It took 19 weeks to do it, but finally, in August of 1981, just in time for MTV's debut, the song hit number one. His video getting played on MTV only kept the song around even more. It became Rick's biggest single of his career. Rick became so popular that he would work on the soap opera during the weekdays, then go on tour gigs with his band on the weekends. He would win the Grammy Award for Best Male Rock Vocal Performance and would have a lot of hits in the 1980s like Don't Talk to Strangers, Affair of the Heart, Calling All Girls, I've Done Everything for You, Human Touch, and a ton more. He's actually acted on General Hospital on and off for the past four decades, and he still puts out albums, and he still goes out on tour. Now, with all of his hit songs and hit albums, not to mention his Grammy Awards, and considering that he's had more hit songs and albums than, say, Men at Work, who are in the ARIA Hall of Fame, I don't get why Rick Springfield isn't in. If there's a technicality as to why he's not there, I can't figure it out. He released his first albums in Australia, and he's from Australia, so that can't be it. I'm a little confused. Especially when you consider that the Bee Gees were actually born in the Isle of Man, which is part of the United Kingdom, but grew up in Australia. And the Bee Gees have been inducted into the ARIA Hall of Fame for decades. Still, kind of confused. Rick Springfield, absolutely 100%, deserves to be inducted into the ARIA Hall of Fame, which is in Melbourne, Australia. And as a reminder as to how good Rick Springfield was and still is to this very day, we have put his greatest hits onto this week's podcast playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening.